Hey, everybody. Welcome to Self-Publishing Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about um, kind of a niche thing, but the thing that will apply to all of you. Stop. Stop. I don't know what that is, but whatever. Never do that again. Sean is so stupid. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. That's his lovemaking dance. Yeah, really. It's like (laughs) courtship. Um, We're going to be talking about, Sean and I just went to Robert McKee's story seminar. And um, and it isn't like a story seminar. The seminar is called Story. It's, it's story the seminar. Story Seminar. Can you tell people who Robert McGee is? I was just going to do that. Robert McKee with the K. McGee, oh, see, is, um, McGee is the like, name of my crazy um, kindergarten teacher who um, Johnny actually got to hear about during dinner with my family. <laughs> so um, he's uh, like, he's like, what? Like the modern guru of story, basically, right? He's been doing this seminar. If for modern years. ends in the 70s, yes. <laughs> yeah, modern and not as modern. Um, but it's like, it was a very comprehensive and Sean and I were, were very pleased going into this because we travel a lot and we host locally in in town a lot for businessy entrepreneurial sorts of things. And this is the first time that we got to go and just focus on story. And it is, it is a master's, you know, course in story, like, holy shit, the amount of dissection of story that we got was a lot in um, three 11 hour days, basically. So, which, which was hard to sit through just because we're not used to sitting, but it was, it was great. So we're going to kind of dissect that, tell you guys, um, you know, some of the things that we took away and, and um, just, we want to talk story basically for the day. So that's what we're going to do. But before that, who's got something cool? Um, I have something cool. Um, the movie Get Out, which um, is it, uh, Dave lit up. Dave, have you seen it or you just want it? No, I, I want to, but I haven't been able to. Yeah, so I don't know if it's playing in my theater. I don't. I don't think they go for that kind of thing here. No, Dave's uh, in Dave's theater. It has a marquee and it says "Get Out," but it's not actually a movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, if 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 at my local theater, if the if the if the the cast is is has more than one person of color, they pretty much get rid of it immediately. It's not <laughs> in your local theater. They say we're not putting up with that shit. Yeah, they burn them. <laughs> So, wow. so Medea never plays there? No, no. God, no, 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 no. Right. And nobody would go because everybody around here is racist. I'm so sad for where Dave lives. Dave, Dave did something very innocent once in Slack. He just shared a photo. And I don't remember what was in the photo. It was like, this is the place, whatever. And it was like, a, um, it was like one of those things in Highlights Magazine where you had to find the hidden pictures. And I was like, there's like four things in this picture that I know Dave are taking for granted that make me really sad. <laughs> It was like it was of somebody's father, and he had like uh, all all these like he was on a bike. He had like all these racist tattoos. They had like uh, a big old rebel flag <laughs> yeah. and a Nazi symbol in the background. It was just like yeah, a typical day in Florida. It was hidden. It was hidden pictures in Highlights Magazine. That's what it was. Um, yeah. So so the first time I mentioned this movie to Dave, he he kind of shat on it. But it was to his credit, he said he he didn't know because it was from Jordan Peele, who is you know, I, I usually don't like my horror and humor mixed. Combined. The only right. exception for Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Uh, but but then I, I I saw more about the movie. I heard an interview with uh, him on NPR, and I, it definitely piqued my curiosity. Yeah, it has a lot on its mind, and it's extremely well executed. And like, there's really nothing about this movie that I don't love or, or some angle because it's a, it's a well-crafted story. It has a couple of, it has a couple of flaws, but they're so tiny and everything else is so good that whatever. Um, I love how, um, how lean it is. It's a very tight script and they didn't, I mean, if you watch a lot of TV, you know, the people in here, there's, I think four names, everyone else is totally unknown. Um, and the names are small, but I think it was made for like $3 million, something like almost nothing. And it's done like 150 million. It's a huge, 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 huge check um, for basically a movie that no one would want to make. He made it for nothing and just killed it. And now Jordan Peele's got a blank check. He can make what he wants. And I think that's really cool. This is a, a really good example of just craftsmanship and big ideas. I mean, it's, it's kind of an incendiary movie and in the best possible way. Like it's, it's, it's an allegory. I mean, it's a horror film, but it's basically about, how people of color feel surrounded by white people all the time and the, the awkward, stupid things that we say. And like, it's just, it's a really tight thriller um, that just, it hits it on every level, including business. Like, I just Wait, are you it. saying color people have feelings? <laughs> what the hell? 
It's fun to imagine I love your the person who tuned in right at that moment. <laughs> There's a, um, For the record, I'm making fun of racist people that live near me. I am not of that. There's a character in um, one of our audiobooks. I won't boil down further than that. But but Sean was like, it's like this voice. I said, oh, you mean Dave's racist guy? <laughs> like that's that's who that they characterized one of our characters as speaking just like that. <laughs> so it's like Jeff Foxworthy drunk, basically. <laughs> um, all right. So Dave, do you have a uh, something cool? No, I only have one cool thing. I got nothing else cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, you can hop in on my something cool, Dave, All right. which is, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this at least some on worst show ever. If not this time, then, then the next time. Um, I met Sean's entire family when we took Woo-hoo! this trip. So, well, I don't know about his entire family, but, but everybody we've heard of, all our favorites. Um, <laughs> I met his mom. I met his dad. I met his sister and her husband. Did you ask his dad about the hero parade? No, but that came up when just privately. Sean was like, I wonder if he'd remember that. <laughs> did his mother dress like she was kidding tammy asks <laughs> uh, a, a little bit it she was pretty subdued it wasn't over the top but sean did pull that out and say what's your favorite to me <laughs> what, what's your favorite thing that i've ever written and I, I i was taking a risk because what if this wasn't it and then she got offended <laughs> dresses like she's kidding <laughs> No, uh, yeah, no. She actually asked, did you ask to borrow a VHS? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but she did have, she did at one point during, we were having margaritas. And so she kind of, she kind of leans back and she pulls out of her purse, like two Ziploc baggies full of gigantic strawberries. And here, here, you want one for your margarita. (laughs) Just carrying them around. It's great. Uh, What actually happened? Does she have like containers in her purse that have like sweet and low and shit in it? No, I didn't yeah. see that. But but we also the other thing was that we we went to one. What was the name Is of her the purse? Like El Torito, like a baby bag. Um, you could hold a seal or something. So we we went to a restaurant called El Torito in L.A. and we we went to the wrong one, and so we were like, well, shit, and so we had to redirect everybody and say, okay, go to this other one, which was like we were looking on the um, I was using Lyft. And it was like, it's like 40 minutes away, but whatever the, you know, chips had been cast or whatever. So we're like, okay, we'll go to that one. And so um, Sean's like, well, my, my, she, she's probably going to beat us there. Like she's, <laughs> she's on her, like they've been texting, they've been figuring it out. And so we got there and we waited and we waited and we waited. And Sean's like texting back and forth with her. And eventually he's like, are you riding a bike here? <laughs> so we got a little bit of time. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, the, the the movie you, oh, oh Dave's already got it yeah it's no it's not Mr Miracle it's Mr Destiny eh, whatever Mr. De- no Mr Mr Destiny. Jim Belushi so. <laughs> Mr Destiny and and Amy's like El Torito like how could you go to El Torito El Torito has a lot of um a lot of uh, <clears throat> meaning for my family it's actually where I had my first date with Cindy and my dad used to go there and get drunk after work all the time it's it's a family it's a family place. that's where i got beat by my father no actually okay i'm going to tell this story because it's quick but it's a it's a good El Torito story or i'll save it for worst show ever actually yeah save it for worst show ever yeah. so if dave has nothing cool then um i feel like i should do an impromptu mention for story for story shop again well maybe not i won't do that i won't bore you guys with it but story shop's open just saying um <laughs> i think that was an impromptu message yeah i know um but I, i'm not giving url i'm, I'm assiduously like I'm not gonna give you the url which is get i'm not gonna leave it it's get, it's get story shop.com or you know just no you probably should not tell people that not gonna tell anybody <laughs> tell so them what again get, get story shop.com now stop because yeah, yeah, let's not tell them okay and it's really great though i won't tell you that it's great but it is it's awesome <laughs> Um, all right, so moving on to the topic of the McKee seminar, um, just like it was really cool to focus on story. Do you want to recap some of what I was saying there, Sean? Like, you- um, yeah, so, so the first time I ever heard of... Um, and Dave's going to chime in. We're going to throw some incendiary things at him. Well, there were a few things. There were a few times where clearly McKee is Dave's spirit animal. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, My favorite are- was... No, no, no. Mo- not okay. Not yet. Wait, okay. wait, <laughs> wait. So, um, w- w- are we doing the good, bad, and ugly here? Like, are we just t- talking kind of? Well, I think we're just kind of jamming. There were let, let's put it this way, just to sum it up. I would say that that eighty to eighty five percent of what he said, um, I personally thought was dead on. It was it was very very cool. One of the things that I remember taking note of early, and I took note only because I thought it was cool that he said it, not because I didn't know it. And it was um, that basically you don't want creative freedom. 
like that's not what you want to make a good story. You want, um, I forget how he put it was like, basically you want parameters. Restrictions. You, want you need fence. those restrictions. You need those parameters because this is how stories are told. You're not going to invent a new way to tell a story. <laughs> so really understand the way stories are told and told the very, tell the very best possible versions of your stories within that framework. But also, is- also niche. It was like, you don't want to write about the great American journey. You want to write about, you know, one family in Arkansas in 1930. By the way, don't steal that idea. Just saying. <laughs> but my so point you is, you don't want to write a unicorn western. You want to write Edward's journey. Well, the unicorn western had restrictions too. The unicorn yeah. western is Edward's journey. Yeah, that's that, that's filled with um, that's filled with restrictions. So, but I thought that that. Sorry, I just want to close the thought, which was I agreed with eighty percent, but then there were things that we were like, what the fuck? And so I think we'll kind of talk through them. Well, right. Okay. So the the twenty percent that we. Well, yeah, we'll get there. So yeah, don't front load the bad because it was it was it was great. Yeah, the 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 first time I ever heard of this guy was um, in the movie adaptation. Um, apparently, he was you know he's pretty famous within Hollywood circles. There's hundreds of Oscar winners who have taken his seminar because um, it's mostly for screenwriters. Yeah, it's mostly for screenwriters. But a we're transitioning into screenwriting, and b screenwriting fundamentals are storytelling fundamentals, right? And so, uh, and a lot of it was just story, right? The first two, well, we'll get to that. So the, the first, the, the, the first time I heard him was during the movie adaptation. And I thought, who is this guy? I wasn't a writer. This was 2002. So I was six years away from even like writing email really. Um, but I do like story. I thought that was all very interesting. And I, I plugged into it in a different way then than I do now. And I was curious. And once I started writing, I wanted to do the McKee thing, but it, it was a lot of money and it just became a, a bucket list type of thing that we were going to do. Um, but I had it on like a recurring task, check on the McKee conference because he does it in London, New York and LA every year. And so um, at the very end of last year, it came up on my thing in you know, my tickle file, basically check that out. And I saw that he had dates in March and I asked John if he wanted to go and I knew Dave wouldn't, <laughs> but John is like, yeah, that sounds awesome. And so, so we went, we didn't and, go to London because that would have made Dave even more mad because he wouldn't go. <laughs> right. So the cool thing about, um, well, th- the conference is three days of just story, like Johnny said. So the first two days is all story and that could be a little bit taxing because it was eight in the morning. It was until, taxing. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> eight in the morning until eight at night. Uh, we had a couple 20 minute breaks and an hour for lunch. Other than that, you're just sitting there. And for me, that's not the best way that I learn information for most people listening to this. No, I dropped out of high school <laughs> because of exactly that. I cannot sit still and just retain in that way. Like I need to be engaged with the material in some way. But the the third day was fantastic because he really laid the grant groundwork for all this over the first two days, where the third day we watched Casablanca live and we basically spent eight hours watching Casablanca and breaking it apart frame. Were by you frame. all in a hotel room crowded around a laptop watching Casablanca? No, no, it was in a it was in a hall. Um but but it was awesome. It was really great to spend that amount of time on Casablanca and um and just break it down and understand um what he was trying to or what the the screenwriters were trying to do or what the the director was trying to do what the actors are trying to do in any given frame that was just amazing and to me um that alone was worth the trip yeah it was um it, there there was there was there was good and bad um more good than bad for sure um, one of the things that that I just thought was fascinating, this is neither good nor bad, is, um, you know, as Sean mentioned, the movie movie adaptation. And uh, we we did, we mentioned this on the SPP we recorded a while ago, but basically after the first day, we're like, we got to watch adaptation because we just watched this dude in front of the, the room for, you know, 11 hours. And hotel internet was only $100. Well, oh, it was great. And you could use, but you could use it in your room, to be clear. Like, just to be fair, you could use it in your room, not in the lobby or anything, just in your room. Um, so... We watched adaptation and watched the McKee character. And first of all, Brian Cox plays McKee so well that I thought it was McKee. And I was like, I was like, oh, he looks a little different. But and Sean's like, well, no, you, you know that's not him, right? It looks like he's dropped quite a lot of weight. <laughs> that's not the same dude. But they're shooting him from kind of far away, and 
he nails, he nails it. it. Yeah, he nails it. But what I thought was funny was it's the same, he t- the same lines. Like the, what they showed was, so I think that Robert McKee with small moder- um, alterations has been giving this exact same presentation for like 33 years. For 34 years, yeah. If you guys remember Liz Scully when we had her on the show, um, she was saying, oh yeah, you guys will have a great time. You'll, you'll love it. But literally it's the same thing every time down to the throat clearing. So it's really, you're watching an actor give a monologue for three days and, and, and his, his, most of his material, I mean, he's, it's not that Kramer versus Kramer and ordinary people in Chinatown, like those are all amazing movies, but a lot of movies have been made since then. And he hasn't really updated his seminar. So to not talk about the work of Pixar or the work of Tarantino, or, I mean, there's so many countless examples, movies in the last, you know, 40 years have been kind of amazing. And so there's a lot of exploration there. And not only did that not really happen, a lot of times modern examples were used to talk about, um, to either reinforce his worldview or just kind of like shit on something new and different that doesn't exactly follow his pattern. So La La Land is a really good example. Um, He said uh, that he can't be generous enough to call La La Land a piece of shit because it doesn't deserve that. (laughs) And to me, like, and he's kind of inconsistent. That's not elitist. <laughs> well, well, right. Well, he is elitist. I mean, he'd be the first to admit it. And he's not consistent either, which is part of the problem. It's the point where I remind everybody that we loved 80% of it. Yeah, it was, it, 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 it was great. But there is stuff to talk about. I want to pay a yeah. lot of money watching an angry guy yell about movies that don't follow his... I actually think that... No, I actually, I actually like the angry guy routine. I thought it was entertaining. Yeah, um, he was angry. funny. One of the things he... When he, he opened great. up... He, he gave a bunch of disclaimers and, and one of them, like he's very opinionated. So like, if you want, if you need your safe place and you're kind of social justice and you want ever like, he's like, no, you're in the wrong fucking place. And he goes, just so everybody knows, you may have noticed I use profanity. I use profanity because uh, I like it. it. Makes me feel good. <laughs> so like he was, he was funny and he was engaging. Um, do you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your, your, well, he, and so, so part of it is just, I mean, I'm, I, I've been, Dave is like a, um, like a vaccine, right? So like, I'm pretty immune <laughs> to that kind of cynicism, but he said some really cynical shit. So I'm going to, well, actually, I don't want to take, is this the one you were going to say earlier? I don't yeah, want to take it, away. it though. Okay. So Dave, tell me if you agree with this because, um, <laughs> he also is of the mind, like a screenplay should take you about three years. Now, if it doesn't take you three or so years, it's probably shit, um, and you should kill yourself. <laughs> but the thing is, writing is so hard. Oh, this is this isn't the one I thought. But yes, go ahead. Actually, this I, I think we I, this isn't the one I was going to do either. <laughs> but okay, so Dave, what do you think? Multiple choice. What is a harder job? Brain surgery, um, grave digger, writer, or rocket scientist? Well, uh, my father actually dug graves. Little known fact there. <laughs> and you get to use dynamite when you dig graves, so that's not hard. Ooh. That's fun. Um, brain surgery is far harder than fucking writing. Okay, not according you to... You are wrong. You are wrong. <laughs> you are absolutely wrong. Those people don't know what it's like to be a writer. They don't know how hard it is. Does he know what it's like to be a brain surgeon? Well, it's way harder than brain way surgery. harder. It doesn't matter. He said these specific... Thing. And it wasn't a throwaway. He spent five minutes on it about oh, how it's harder he than five minutes on anything. He spent 15 on this at least. <laughs> he went on and on and on about how writing was the hardest thing in the world. Brain surgeons have nothing on it. Rocket scientists have nothing on it. Manual labors have nothing on it. Because- uh, okay. I would just like to tell him to go fuck himself. <laughs> If, I, I want to bring my dad to one of those uh, things <laughs> and, and see what he says. Like, oh. No, it's, it's, it was ludicrous. And, and he went on and on and on about it, about how difficult it is. And like, it's just so painful. And I know he's just like validating his... Oh, yeah, you get off the fucking cross, yeah. dickhead. But yeah, right, right. There was a lot of that and I just don't buy that. But then he takes it to the furthest extreme. <laughs> this was my... Wait, 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 wait. wait did, did he say it's, it's harder than being God? <laughs> <laughs> no. You think he compare did. himself to a god? No, he did. He constantly reminded oh. us that we were all gods. Oh, okay. That we had godlike authority. <clears throat> <laughs> so, um, so no, he uh he said that no matter how successful you are as a writer, no matter how much you end up doing for yourself, 
there's not enough money to ever account for the amount of shit you have to eat as a writer. Do you agree with that, Dave? No, I've taken far more shit and far less paying jobs. So. <laughs> well, right. All right, so. well then let me give Dave the other one and then we'll move on to some lessons. So the other one, and I wanna see if you agree with this, is that most human beings are incapable of love. Do, do, do. I love that Dave has to think. Yeah, I know. Most, most human beings. Most, and Sean turns to me and goes, did, did, did he say most? <laughs> I was, okay. I was flabbergasted. I would say that most human beings are capable of selfish love, but not in selfish love or unselfish love. Uh, I would say most human beings are incapable of critical thinking, though. If he said that, I'd be all <laughs> most. So, okay, so here's the example he gave, and then I know we'll move into some positivity. <laughs> but, but this one just blew my mind. He's doing this whole scene. This, is, this kind of proves his point. This is his worldview, is that people are just like, they're not, they're not capable of love. So he's describing the scene as, he frames it as the most unbelievable scene you could possibly write. <laughs> he, wait, 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 before you go to this, he just sounds like a guy that's justifying his worldview by pinning it on everybody else. Well, isn't that what you do? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah all right so so he's painting the scene of like what is pretty much the most unbelievable scene that you could possibly write okay here it is there's a man and a woman okay they're having dinner he just bought her flowers and there's a candlelight between them and they're like i love you okay he's and, trying to give examples of something that might be in a screenplay that crosses his desk or something okay oh. so now, that's a pretty shitty scene. It's boring. There's no conflict. Right. But he's not talking about storytelling here. He's talking about life. The reason that's not believable is because no man would buy his wife flowers or light a candle if he wasn't hiding something or doing something wrong. Nobody has dinner at the table unless there's trouble. Unless right. <laughs> right. He said, if you're eating at the table, and we eat at the table every night, I love yeah. buying flowers. Okay. Like, Clearly, he is not only an elitist, but he's a Hollywood elitist. Uh, and fuck, fuck, fuck him. Okay. So can we move over? Can we leave this? Yes, because yes. the whole idea was this is, this is, we're telling you eccentricities. Um, I will just, like, if anybody who is interested, who, who is interested in screenwriting, who is interested in story, who can feasible, I mean, it's expensive who can afford this and afford to go and be able to go, you should do it. Like, I, do you agree? Sean? Oh yeah. Yeah. I can, I go with you next time just so I can laugh. <laughs> well, yes. But <laughs> if you'll actually go with us, I'm a hundred percent there. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was worth every penny and bring your mom with her purse full of strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> She's already there. Um, but yeah, I would, I would, I wanted to do it for a long time. I'm really grateful that we did it. And I feel like, we came back and our stories will be sharper. Our storytelling will be sharper. Our teaching will be sharper. And um, no, I'm, I'm thrilled that we did it. Does he have like a, does, does he fake a voice or anything? Like, eh, this is the way it is. And this is the only way it is. No, but he's, you can tell he's a lecturer. Like it, it's done like a lecture. It's unlike, like Sean said, it's done like a performance. Um, and it was great for that. Um, but like, what were some of your favorite takeaways? From this, Sean. I mean, I'll I'll start with um and and this again, like a lot of this because we spend so much time on story is stuff that we we knew, but you hear it reinforced, you hear it in a different way. Um, I think one of mine was uh, uh, subtext or uh, conscious versus unconscious motivation of a character. Yeah, I love that a lot too. And I mean, th this is this is a great takeaway just for anybody creating. It's the difference between what a character says they want and what they actually want. Right, and, and he went into, into depth a lot. And, and actually that scene is one of the scenes he was using to illustrate the point, which is, um, what is, what does he want? Um, a, a nice dinner, a nice candle at dinner. What does he really want to get out of trouble because, or to bury the secret, right? Well, I will say, you know, going back to that, I, I can't imagine he actually believes that. Maybe he's just saying that's just better storytelling, that somebody wouldn't be having dinner unless they're hiding something. I right, he, that's sweet that you believe that. So, yeah, really <laughs> well, I'm an optimist. I like yeah. believing the best I, of everyone. I do know that about you. Um, no, but it's, it's, a, it's a case, um, you know, another thing was that a character won't, and I'm, I'm sure we can all agree with this, a character generally won't reveal their biggest secrets unless it's a lesser of evils. So 
Right. If you have something that's a secret, the only reason you're ever going to divulge that to the audience, to the reader, to somebody else is, um, unless you're in an internal monologue in a book, is unless if something worse is going to happen. Yes, unless I you- killed all those people in the basement, but it was only because they saw me eating the children. <laughs> well, I was going to go with, um, <laughs> wow, you're going to give me that speeding ticket, but I'm dragging a corpse behind me. So, um, you know, that like basically, and that was a joke, so that's not a real example, but like <laughs> what a character wants, their actions, and this is where the secret thing, their <clears throat> actions, um, there was a lot of like letting the actions demonstrate and, and minimal dialogue, like that was his personal thought. Um, but the actions demonstrate their true, their true motivation, their true, their subconscious desire, what they really want. Whereas their, their dialogue and their other things, their more overt things that they do may pretend, may faint at demonstrating something else. So what was the, um, what, what was the movie where he said that the, the, I can't remember what it was, where the man, he was having serial relationships, relationship after relationship. What movie was that? With, he was a woman. Story. The, the character in the movie was a womanizer and he said, I if I give you the punchline, it's going to throw it all away. Well, whatever it was, I forget what the movie was. I was hoping Sean would remember it. But um, he's like, well, what does this character say he wants? And, you know, at this point he did kind of ask people to, to guess. And, you know, oh, well, a, a relationship or whatever, because the character, I wish I remembered the movie. Well, he's always trying Me another too. relationship. And um, so they said, what does he really want? And people are guessing, guessing, and it took somebody to finally get it. And he said, to punish women. Like that was this character is what he really wanted subconsciously he would never know it. He wouldn't admit it, but that's what his actions demonstrate. We see he's trying to ruin the sequence of people. You don't remember that? No, I, I, I don't know what movie that is. Okay. But there were others like that. There was another movie. I don't remember where, um, uh, it's <laughs> Mr. Rogers. It was Mr. Rogers. <laughs> it was another where it was a character and she, um, you may know this one where she, um, got involved with a, a criminal in some way. And it was like, what does she want? Does she want to save this guy or whatever? And he said, no, she wants um, like abandon, like transcendence, to have a transcendent experience. So knowing your character's true motivations versus what they would say or maybe even think themselves they want is a huge deal. Yeah, I think that is a huge deal. And I think you can actually take that one step further too. And it's not just about knowing what your characters say they want versus what they actually want. I think that's true for your readers too. Um, if you look at your reader, whatever genre you are, there's a surface level where they're reading this genre for this reason. But if you really tap into the true reason they're reading that genre, then you can do a better job connecting with them. Um, I also like that, uh, he spent a lot of, well, maybe not a lot of time, but in the opening and that first day uh, about the difference between good prose and good storytelling and that they really are not the same thing. And there's a lot of truth to that. We see, that's why, you know, um, I mean, all the time I'll see books that I think are very poorly written and they're doing really well. And they're doing really well because the story is in place. It doesn't matter that the book is not, I mean, it does matter, but you take a, a, a shitty written book where the story is in place versus a well-written book where the story is all over the place and the story in place is going to have happier readers. So it is more important to focus on telling a well-crafted story um, than anything else. And the, the science of screenplays really make you focus on the story because it is so exact. <laughs> what is Dave smirking at? <laughs> I, I'm just imagining that this guy like sounded like a Nihilist Arby's Twitter account. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nihilist Arby's is pretty great. No, he wasn't like that. Um, he was actually very engaging, but he had very polarizing views and would not flinch from them. Like that was no, actually he's an, old, in the, he's an old white dude. What do you expect? He is, but it's funny because in the, the stuff, well, he's all over the place. I'm like, is he Republican? Is he Democrat? Is he conservative? Is he liberal? Who knows? It's hard but, to know anything. Yeah. But in the emails, like several times, like Mr. McKee has very strong opinions on culture, society, blah, whatever. Just be warned. Because you're just like, you're just waiting. Who's he going to offend now? And the fact that that was the number one note inside the packet we got. The first thing you see. Like, <laughs> Please okay. don't sue him. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, about, um, what about image systems? I thought that was really fascinating. I thought that was fascinating. That's, that's a lot what? of, well, we're, we'll describe it. See, look, Dave's interest is peaked. to this must Yes. Be. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I do think that the more you can crib um, filmmaking into your, novels the better you are like that if you do if you take the right things anyway 
So image system, that uses a visual word, image. And so, again, most of this was about screenwriting, but it would apply as well. So an image system is sort of a, cons a repeating element that lays below the surface. So if it jumps out at you, I actually think he said this, if you're, if you're like immediately like, oh, okay, that's the image system, like I can tell, then you're doing it wrong. It should be something that's very subtle. So um, one in, hold on, did I, did I note what they were? Some of the ones that I noted were, um, I got it here, hang on. So um, uh, in the movie Diabolique, uh, water, mm. like water is used at all the pivotal moments. It's, it, there's a lot of fog, it's raining, there's a, a drowning and- Oh, uh, and how somebody else might use like the color red to indicate like something like- Yeah, like red is, a, red is actually a visual in um, Sixth Sense. It's yeah. repeated over. Also over. in uh, Schindler's List. Right, right. Um, like Lego movie fatherhood, like all the, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of male archetypes and obviously not a spoiler for the Lego movie, but there's a whole fatherhood thing there that occurs. <laughs> um, you just the Lego movie. Um, alien. Oh, oh, I got, I said one word aloud. I said one word aloud during the seminar. Oh, do you remember what it was, Sean? I do. Penis. Well, Penis is, is plural. And it was an answer to this question is um, he was talking about like, what's the image system in Alien? And I actually knew it right away, but I wasn't willing to jump out right away and say it. But he goes, they hired as the, um, the, the art director, H.R. Geiger. And he goes, what is he known for? And I said, penises. <laughs> because if you look at his art, it's all penises and vaginas. Like all Geiger art is. I thought it was all like satanic looking stuff. No, it's all penises and vaginas. Oh. Um, and so he's like, yeah, sex organs. Basically, that's the image system. He says there's no fewer, he said like two or three rapes in that movie, like symbolically. Um, but Aliens is um, motherhood. You know, she has, it's Ripley and Newt. They're after the, um, the big mother alien. Chopping that penis has. off. <laughs> right, well, uh, there's that. Um, so the image systems I thought were really interesting, like a repeating thematic element in Casablanca one of them was the idea of Casablanca this sort of refugee refugee city as like a prison and so there were all of these like in the back there were all these vertical bars um, like even just shadows were like vertical shadows. bars a lot of shadows. Um, there was a there's a, a searchlight that would normally be like to keep planes from coming into this or crashing into the city or whatever like a but it on Casablanca it, it shines on the ground like a searchlight from a, a tower and so it gives you this claustrophobic prisony feel watching this movie these people being trapped and i thought that was fascinating so yeah, how do you I, incorporate that into your book writing well it's just it's a it's a recurring theme like if you pick something um like we did it um uh a little bit in in axis or maybe we shied away from it i know we talked about this image system very specifically well, we wanted a literal image system and the problem with meaning it was visual and the problem with that is that this is one area where filmmakers have a major advantage. Um, we always talk about traffic in this. <laughs> yeah, so, so Sean and I are, are working on some scripts right now, and I've noticed the advantage that we have as novelists to explain in ways that aren't immediately obvious. Like you can't have internal monologue or you know, a character's thoughts usually in a movie. And so we have that advantage, but the filmmakers have the advantage of what Sean was talking about is we wanted to differentiate which scenes were real and which scenes weren't. And so we, we considered doing like, um, he was wearing a wedding ring in the scenes that were real or something. But the problem with that is you have to keep mentioning the fucking wedding ring. It and becomes be obvious. Different. Then it becomes overwritten, right? right. So, Why does he keep adjusting his wedding ring? But, but, but you, can, you can take that image system, what it's trying to accomplish and accomplish the same thing through like you could do the area. water one the water one i mentioned for diabolique that's something that could very easily be water right. simple or Maybe or words that have specific sound right words phrasing ideas but it's the idea to have some like rep, rep i mean don't mean repetitive in a bad way but a repetitive anchor something that, that keeps you know returning throughout the story um dude the the thing i loved that whole thing about exposition is ammunition Mm -hmm, um, me too. That I never is. heard that put quite that way. And I think that's a really powerful idea that can make both um, dialogue better, um, but just world building better too. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about dialogue as ammunition, which is a, a cool phrase even. Well, it's actually exposition as ammunition. Oh, oh yeah. What did I say? So you said dialogue. Oh, yeah. so this is interesting. So this is actually a variation on show, don't tell, which um, 
I think is any, any advice I feel is dangerous applied, you know, without question. But in general, the idea of showing something that's, that needs, like showing a character's actions or motivations for certainly for characters is always better than explaining. So Stephen King actually uses this example in on writing. He said, if I describe Annie Wilkes and she's, you know, kind of like looking at the floor and her hair is dirty, like she hasn't washed in a few days and she's moping around and blah, blah, blah. And you get the, the picture of how she's feeling. That's, he said, that's way better than me saying, Allie, you know, um, uh, why I just forgot her name. She's um, depressed and sad today, you know, so you want to show, but in this example, it was like one step further. And again, sort of for filmmakers was, you know, usually we would say, okay, well, you want to do it through dialogue and action, but he's almost like, see if you can do it without dialogue, you know, see if you can do it through. Um, so exposition obviously is conveying information that the audience or the reader needs to know, uh, but that the characters will already know. So like if John and Mary used to be married, then something the audience may need to know is that John and Mary used to be married and they had a divorce or something. So you can have a scene where they sit down and say, you know, Mary, back when you were my wife and we got the divorce, like that's a terrible example of it, but that's the sort of, sort of ham-fisted thing that people will do to just, you know, the coffee shop scene. So where are you with your boyfriend problem? And so he wanted, the idea <laughs> of using favorite. his ammunition is to slip in those facts as the as ammunition metaphor. I miss a little bit. Can do you, you want to take this the rest of the way, Sean? It's um, to dramatize your exposition. Is the idea? Yeah, it's because there's no in in an exchange like that. It's just kind of flaccid, right? And there's no real point to it. If, but you could take the same thing where you're delivering information, but doing it with like a lot of drive and a lot of urgency. If you all of a sudden you turn it into something um, almost hostile. Um, where let's say um, they're angry at each other and it's apparent that they were divorced, but it, it drives conflict. Yeah. Anger than a sit down scene. Right. Like imagine they could be sitting at a, a restaurant table and she could like start moving stuff around and he like moves it back. <laughs> <laughs> or, or what, what if I don't understand that? Could try. I don't know. I think Dave's most people real, are incapable. I mean, if you're sitting funny. down, then it means there's trouble. Like, Maybe you could just put him at a dinner table. <laughs> Dave just revealed how petty he is. So he's sitting <laughs> at the table and he just moves it back. I have a feeling that happened with Miss Redacted last week. Oh, he's nodding. It did it. Oh my God. I love that our shows are Dave's therapy. Okay. So, um, yeah, I imagine like two, two characters and they're waiting outside and they're going to um, like, there's maybe a, their daughter's performance. And all you know is that this is their daughter's performance, but think about all the things you can tell them. Um, um, all of a sudden they start fighting. Okay. So the scene opens, they're waiting for the performance to start and they're sitting next together. So according to the camera, they're a happy couple. They're married. They're waiting for their daughter. Right. Um, but then it's, 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 it's late. Like people are getting restless. They're turning to each other. And, um, all of a sudden she says something really snippy to him and he snips back at her. And um, uh, all of a sudden she says something just really bitchy that he probably deserved about like, well, and that's why I left right now, you know that they're not together. Um, and then she says something else about, well, or, well, at least I'm here. At least I made it. Well, it's about time, right? Then you know that, well, he was working too much or something. And that's one of the reasons they got divorced. So this whole fight can, can really, provide a lot of um a, it gives you the same information but it uses it in a way that drives the story forward right and especially if you have that because i mean we've done shows on this before how you can really drive a lot of exposition through arguing but using the word ammunition i think is even more powerful because it's like you can have somebody it's a hammer they're wanting to drive something home they're wanting to be right they're wanting to win their marriage right <laughs> so actually that's a good way to frame it if you want to win your marriage but you know drive through exposition at the same time um, another thing that, um, that I really liked was the focus on, on conflict. So we all know that conflict drives a story forward, but, um, he, he did this, like, I didn't get it at first. And then he kept mapping it out in various different oh, ways. In the the gap. Yeah. The gap thing. So the idea is you always want to give, I mean, if a character's going to have her, her happy ending, you want to give her what she wants, but not via the route that she thinks she's going to get it. And, um, or take it away, but not via, you know, the route that she thought she was going to get it. And this, especially true of the audiences or the readers in, in our cases is, you know, go ahead and, and let the, the 
thing conclude in the way that that it needs to the appropriate um conclu- uh, ending to the book or whatever but never via the course that anyone would expect and so he did it via this branching like system of arrows or whatever and the sort of the metaphor of a gap so you know um somebody goes to somebody's house and they're gonna um beg them for forgiveness and they got it all scripted out but then the person opens the door and they're pissed for a totally different reason and then to use his words, a gap opens between character A's expectation and where character B is meeting them, basically. And then so they have to try something else. And so it was this constant, like this metaphor of constantly like, oh, I can't get what I want that way. Okay, well, I'll try this way. And I can't get what I want that way. And a slow ratcheting up of tension such that at the end, that you, that's how you reach the climax is, well, I didn't want to do it this way. I didn't want to do it this way. But eventually you have to because the gap keeps opening and through conflict. Yeah, and, and not to not to contradict ourselves or or McKee at all here, um, but it is kind of interesting that after I mean there was a lot of really prescriptive stuff. This is the way story works, and if you violate this, you know God help you. He actually said that many times. God help you if you do this thing, whatever it is. Like he actually had commandments. But there is no God. <laughs> so, but that me was, that was really constant, and yet the underlying message and Johnny. Tell me if you don't think this is right, but I think even beyond all of that really specific, specific advice, he kept saying, you know what? Just tell a good story. Ultimately, the things that matter are tell a good story. Yeah, he, he did. Um, and one of the things he said that I just gave him huge props for was he said, um, I forget what the example was, like, can I do this? Can I do this? People would come up to him. Um, can I put this in my story? And he would say, look, you, of course you can. He said, you can do anything as long as it works. And it working is a much more subjective idea than a story should have three or four acts or whatever it is. Like it, rather than all the architectured things before, it basically boiled down to, do you ultimately, are you ultimately going to tell a good story? And that I think was very liberating. So just as an example, um, this is a little meta. But adaptation, which the more, it's one of those movies like it's a worm in my brain and the more I think about it, the more I kind of want to see it again, is because it is a movie about making a movie, a movie about adapting a movie, there's a lot of kind of meta like what should happen in this act and this inciting incident. And one of the things McKee said, look, the whole thing, he's like, he's like, don't, God help you, don't do voiceover. And actually what's funny is that we heard him say that live after hearing a whole bunch about it in adaptation. Because that's the whole thing, like, hold on, am I doing voiceover? Like McKee wouldn't like that I'm doing voiceover. And this is in voiceover in the movie. <laughs> and yet, so Sean and I were like, do you think he'd like this movie? Did he give permission to use his, you know, his image and stuff? And he does. And that movie is very atypical and it uses voiceover and it, it breaks a lot of the rules, but it does it all. But it, it works. It, know your why, right? Like what's the reason you're doing it? Well, and, and that's the, the, the disconnect I think I had a little with him because there are examples of films that work like La La Land, right? Where it, it may not, it works. It, people are going back to see that again and again and again because it touches them, because it's a story that spoke to them in some way. So therefore it see, works. People went to Neverland Ranch. Ti- Titanic, yes. Titanic is also a piece of shit, by the way. Right, right, right. Yeah. So um, there were definitely a few pieces of shit there. But, but actually Titanic is at least a piece of shit. He's not generous enough for La La Land to be a piece of shit. Um, So, I mean, that just kind of disappoints me because I don't know why you need to crap on somebody else's art when it was clearly jealous. It's it's a beautiful... You know what it is? La La Land for him should be a three star or a two star. Right. Right. But life isn't one or five star. It's not binary in that way. So, but, but, but having said that, yes, if you're listening to this right now um, and you are interested in storycraft... Um, it's absolutely worth going. Um, it will make you a better storyteller. If you have the stamina for three days, it is crazy. I also love how he acknowledged what a shitty schedule it was. Like he got back after whatever whatever made his his schedule. I'd love to shoot the asshole who made the schedule in the face. (laughs) Right. So, um, but anybody here could buy his book. Um, his book is just on Amazon. It's thick. It's called Story. It's called He's story. got a new one called Dialogue. Yeah, and it's we 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 got Dialogue. We'll we'll read that. Um, but Story is really great. I read it several years ago. Um, the seminar was great. Uh, just a few like little structural things that I I just want to ping out there. I don't want to go into a ton of detail because you, it would take forever. Um, but I think it was interesting. So 
Um, I actually don't know. I mean, his definition of of act climax as an act, I think, was a little more liberal than than what a lot of people consider an act. But um, so, for instance, he said Casa yeah, Marta has four acts. Was his he, and and I thought this was really interesting. AI I has four acts. <laughs> AI clearly <laughs> has four acts. I agree with him. I agree with anyone who says that. I, AI might have like seven or eight acts. Like Did he some, like AI? I he didn't know, talk about it. it. But oh, um, I love that movie. But you know how we talk about the, Sean calls it the soggy metal. I'm trying to get away from that because it just sounds gross. But it's like you have your act one climax in, in a movie. It's usually around, you know, or in a book, it's usually around 25%, something like that. And then you have your, your act three climax is very close to the end. And your act two climax is closer to act three than it is to act two. So in other words, act two is the long one. It's the hard, like conflict and ratcheting up of tension, but but it's that's the one everybody gets stuck on. It's like, what do I have happen? How do I drive that long second act? And he said, what usually happens is what filmmakers usually do is they just, they break it up. They have a mid act climax, which by his definition is that's another act. So the word in Hollywood is mid act climax. I think that's the word. And it basically means in the middle of act two, there's a little climax. And he's like, well, that's four acts. And he said, by that definition, most modern films, much like most people, uh, most modern films are four acts, which I thought was interesting to pay attention to. Um, also, just mechanically, we talk about the inciting incident, which is where life as normal and then something disrupts it. And this is where the whole story begins. Is He gave a bunch of examples that I thought were great. He said, um, a lot of movies, again, movies, but this happens with books too. We have um, page one of Invasion has the inciting act. He's like, a lot of times it begins with the inciting act, but sometimes it'll take you know, a few percent of a book or in a movie, like five, 10, 15. Um, I want to say life is beautiful. He said 50 minutes, five zero is when the inciting incident occurs. Right. Because it's all a setup. Like you have to, they have to get you in the perfect emotional state before they change it. And I think the, the, the point there is what are you trying to accomplish with your inciting incident? So with invasion, we're, what we're trying to accomplish is like, okay, we're just shoving the reader down the slide right now. Like it's starting and like, go. Um, that, that book is very in many arrests where life is beautiful. You've got this whole sweet, like romantic comedy that where you learn to love this woman and the child that they have together. Because then when they go, when they're taken to the hall or taken to the concentration camps, it's gutting, like it's horrible. So that 50 minutes makes that inciting incident exponentially works but you have to know why you're doing it if you just don't get to your inciting incident right your book because you didn't get to it that's yeah his his rule was you delay the inciting incident only as long as you have to in order to set up the emotional reaction that you want the inciting incident to provoke so if you're just wheeling along then you're fucking it up but if you're trying to as in life is beautiful establish like there's no emotion well there'd be some but there's not nearly as much emotional resonance if in Life is Beautiful, day one is going to the concentration camp. No, because you don't care. Minutes. Why do you care? You don't know the um, people. You know, I mean, that's happened all throughout, or throughout history. We've all seen Holocaust movies. It's not that we're numb to it, but you haven't given us any reason to care about this particular family. But <clears> by <throat> seeing their whole courtship, and then it opens five years later, and you see that they have this beautiful child. Joshua, Joshua. Like, it's just so sweet. And then it's, it's horrible. So, um, and then this is maybe the last point is, is this is also um, technical, but I thought it was really good is if you delay the inciting incident, then the, the way that you um, bridge that gap, like 50 minutes is a long fucking time or, you know, 30% of your book, you have to introduce subplots and each subplot has an inciting incident. A subplot I thought he played fast and through. loose with the term subplot though. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, if you've seen Casablanca, there was, he called the Bulgarian wife subplot, which is two scenes. You, you see her, and then she's basically saying, should I sleep with this guy to get out of the Yeah, life? which technically I get that that's a, I mean, it's a, I don't know, like maybe a sub-story. The word plot implies more to me than those examples gave. But, but, but in yeah. Life is Beautiful, it's the story, you know, the family story. Yeah. The story. So anyway, so that's... Um, a kind of a fast and quick dissection of the McKee seminar. Like I said, 80% we thought we were, was spot on. There was a lot we disagreed with. Casablanca, 
violated all of his rules. Every one of his rules. Yeah, like uh, one of my favorites was you can't have any metaphor in a script whatsoever. But I mean, personally, I, I metaphor is shorthand a lot of time. <laughs> so metaphor is great. And Casablanca is filled with metaphor. And this is the script that we studied as the example. But I can't think of a script that I've read without. And I, I read good scripts, right? I read scripts that have been made into movies. And a ton of them have metaphor. I think all of them have had at least one because writers speak in metaphor. So there were a few things like that that I didn't even quite understand. Um, but I think the bottom line is there, rules are meant to be broken. It's understand. I think what he meant was no shitty metaphors, right? And I, right. we can all agree on that. No shitty metaphors, no shitty story structure, um, you know, but, but bend the rules, break the rules. Because even if someone like McKee doesn't like it, you could still make the next La La Land. All right, which was a piece of shit if we're being generous. So uh, that's been it for self-publishing podcast. Um, thought it was great. That was great to focus on story for a few days. And um, just remember, story shop is open. Dave wouldn't let me. Uh, Dave doesn't want me to talk about it. And no, it's <laughs> get story. You know, by now it's storyshop.io, but you can also go to getstoryshop.com. Uh, if you want to waste I'll your time, it. we'll mention it. Uh, so anyway, so thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.